All righty, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Darren Grimm. I'm an associate professor of history and Southern studies here at the University of Mississippi. And it's my pleasure today to introduce my colleague, Chuck Ross, for his talk on protests and pro football, 1965, 2020. Uh, Dr. Ross's uh, Talk is going to examine both the events leading up to the 1965 American Football League All-Star Game protest and the events that led to Colin Kaepernick's 2016 NFL protest. Ross will also address and discuss the legacy of Kaepernick's actions in the wake of the death of George Floyd and the different responses by professional sports leagues and teams in America. Uh, professor Chuck, uh, Dr. Chuck Ross is a native of Columbus, Ohio, and currently is professor of history and African American studies at the University of Mississippi. He holds a BA in history from Stillman College. He has an MA in Black Studies and an MA in history and a PhD in history, each from the Ohio State University. He is the author of Mavericks, Money and Men, the AFL, Black Players and the Evolution of Modern Football, which was published by Temple University Press in 2016. And Outside the Lines, African Americans and the Integration of the National Football League, which was released by New York University Press in 1999. His teaching interests include 20th century US history, African American history, and sports history. He has appeared on ESPN's Outside the Lines and on ESPN radio. Uh, welcome, Dr. Chuck Ross. Hand it over to you. Hey, thanks a lot, Darren. I appreciate that gracious uh, introduction. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, Center for the Study of Southern Culture, uh, Athen Thomas, uh, uh, reaching out to me and thinking enough of me to ask me to come on. Everyone that is here that has decided to tune in, I was joking with Darren earlier before we came on about how the this Zoom uh, format, this Zoom life that we're in now is causing me to do a whole lot of work uh, because people can just reach out and grab you and ask you to do stuff right in your house while you're in your, you know, in your house. Normally you could you'd be on campus maybe and move around and hide a little bit, but there's no hiding anymore. Um, Today, what I wanted to talk about is um, this whole protest narrative, this whole history of kind of protest. Uh, interesting love in, in pro football. Um, and uh, I want to look at um, events that lead up to uh, something that a lot of people aren't really familiar with. American Football League starts 1960. Um, it has an uh, a all star game that is scheduled for Houston Tech. I'm sorry for uh, New Orleans uh, in 1965, and um, black players that are all stars come to New Orleans, get upset, and they end up uh, forcing the game to be changed. And there's a kind of protest legacy that uh, begins there, and and uh, of course. Uh, in 2016, everyone is well aware of Colin Kaepernick uh, taking a knee uh, and basically articulating that during the national anthem, uh, he wanted to send a message about uh, racial discrimination in America and particularly uh, police brutality uh, as relates to uh, in, in more specific African-American males at the hands of, of police officers. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we just uh, had the most watched event in America, of course, the Super Bowl, and uh, the NFL was really caught in the middle of this whole Kaepernick issue. Uh, initially, they tried to kind of embrace Kaepernick, and then the president of the United States at the time kind of came back and said, hey, these folk aren't really grateful, and so many owners began to backtrack and say, hey, you can't stand or you can't do something demonstrative do it during that during the anthem and then of course George Floyd came about and everybody the NFL kind of decided oh we made a mistake uh, we got to have uh, all kind of people's names on helmets let players make statements so on and so forth um, and even 
uh, if you had the opportunity to watch the Super Bowl this weekend, you saw that clearly there was a conscious effort uh, as it relates to, um, you know, making sure that you've got African-Americans integrated uh, in, 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 some, in some very, you know, high levels in terms of, in terms of commercials. Uh, Drake uh, was on the State Farm commercial. You had Tracy Morgan uh, trying to sell you uh, insurance via, via Rocket Mortgage. Uh, Serena Williams uh, on a Michelob commercial. And of course you had the weekend uh, as your halftime uh, entertainment. And uh, again, uh, when you start thinking about the whole economics of all of this, um, Super Bowl commercials this year went for a cool $5.6 million for 30 seconds. And so African-Americans are playing a role in, uh, although uh, this whole concept of social justice is kind of hanging over, uh, there's a clear understanding that when you look at these NFL teams, they are made up primarily of African-American players. This picture here uh, is from the San Francisco 49ers of 2016. Uh, NFL players today make up about 70% of the overall percentage of players in the National Football League. And so I wanted to kind of start off with that, that, that image because uh, they, in essence, uh, buy into Colin Kaepernick's um, argument, uh, reasoning, uh, and it facilitates a significant amount of kind of stress and strain. But uh, before we can get to Colin Kaepernick, um, we have to, I believe, start uh, in the 1950s uh, because this context is going to really shape uh, when we start talking about, when I start talking about uh, these black players and this protest that takes place in New Orleans. Um, of course, right here in Mississippi, uh, and Mississippi has always uh, been, and that'd be a whole nother different, whole nother lecture, but uh, race and racial strife and friction have been the foundation of this state. Uh, and uh, when you start looking at um, the post-Civil War period, uh, black holes being um, passed first by Mississippi, uh, the first state to do so uh, in, this, in this time period, uh, and um, after World War II, and more particularly after the uh, United States Supreme Court hands down its Brown decision, uh, not too far from here, uh, in a small little uh, thoroughfare called Money, Mississippi, uh, the young man in this picture here, Emmett Till, of course, um, ventured down with his uh, uncle, uh, to hang out with his relatives during the summer of 1955. And in the course of arriving in Mississippi, uh, he found himself in the crosshairs of its legacy of violence as it relates to African-Americans. Uh, Teal supposedly went in the store, a lady behind the store named Carolyn Bryant. Uh, he bought candy. Uh, she left out of the store. Uh, after he left out of the store, he whistled at her. Uh, this incident was reported uh, eventually to her husband, Roy Bryant, and his half-brother, J.W. Milam. Uh, several individuals uh, have been uh, speculated to, of course, been involved in this incident. Uh, Emmett Till was kidnapped. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, they, Brian and Milam went to his uncle's house, demanded that he be turned over. Uh, the audacity of him crossing the line, this, 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 this social understanding that African-American males be extremely deferential to white women. Uh, and of course, he is uh, killed. Uh, his, uh, there is a trial and, and there is, uh, takes this uh, jury uh, less than about a little bit over an hour, about 60 minutes or so to sit around uh, and decide that Milam and Bryant were uh, not guilty. Uh, this incident uh, is looked upon as one of the seeds of the civil rights movement, in certain, so to speak. I know my historian friends uh, want 
to push the civil rights movement back in the 1930s, and that's fine. I know that we're into this long uh, narrative now around the civil rights movement, but um, this incident brings a whole host of individuals, journalists and other individuals to Mississippi, and they began to see things that um, just kind of blow them away in terms of the conditions for African-Americans. Uh, and in essence, uh, Emmett Till is really directly linked to Rosa Parks because Rosa Parks, uh, before she decides on December the 1st uh, not to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, she went to a meeting on the 27th of November in 1955. Uh, and at this meeting, she was, uh, she had an opportunity to meet and listen to Dr. T.R.M. Howard. Dr. Howard talked about what happened to Emmett Till, went through a blow by blow, uh, and gave great detail to this mass meeting of individuals. And Rosa Parks was sitting in that meeting and she was just blown away. Uh, she'd already decided to come to the meeting because of what had happened, but the details really just crystallized inside of her, uh, this understanding that, um, uh, you know, she really had to do something uh, and that uh, there's only so much folk can take because when you start talking about a 14 year old child, um, that really begins to kind of draw the line. And so um, about four days later, uh, she's on a bus and she decides that she is not going to give up her seat. Uh, and of course, this spawns a whole host of activity. Black women, uh, particularly connected with Alabama State, uh, print off handbills and advocate for African Americans to stay off the bus uh, for uh, one day. And that, of course, evolves into another mass meeting uh, in which a formal organization is uh, created uh, the Montgomery Improvement Association. Uh, they decide to reach out to a young um, minister, uh, make him head of that uh, organization, uh, and a full-scale one-year boycott begins. Uh, and, of course, all eyes are on Montgomery, uh, Alabama, uh, and eventually, of course, uh, the federal government steps in, uh, and in essence, uh, basically stipulates you cannot uh, basically have uh, segregation on buses, can't discriminate on buses. Uh, it's a victory. Uh, and of course, Dr. King is catapulted to the national spotlight as a result of this year long boycott. He will set up SCLC. Uh, he will uh, firm, uh, firmly believe in nonviolence uh, as a strategy to try to deal with uh, legal status of African-American, social status, economic status. Uh, he will uh, really reach the apex when he is able to apply this kind of strategy and pressure to get the federal government to capitulate and hand down two key pieces of federal legislation, the 64 Civil Rights Act uh, and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And so, um, interestingly enough, it is within this backdrop that um, these African-American players in American Football League find themselves uh, in New Orleans uh, in early January of 1965. Uh, the American Football League, founded in 1960, uh, Lamar Hunt over on the left, uh, Bud Adams on the right, Lamar Hunt, very, very, very wealthy um, uh, heir, to the Hunt Oil family uh, and wanted to own a football team, tried to buy a football team from several uh, NFL owners, uh, was uh, in essence uh, turned away, uh, basically patted on the back and, and said, well, you know, don't feel bad about it because there are a lot of other people out there that's been approaching folk about buying NFL teams. They're hard to come by and this isn't personal, uh, but we're not gonna sell you our team. And so Lamar Hunt, uh, being someone who, you know, has this, uh, had a certain amount of internal fortitude, uh, who uh, no, just wasn't really a part of uh, his stratosphere. And so 
uh, he sat on an airplane, decided, uh, you know, if they are saying that I can't buy a team, I'll just start my own league. And he began to reach out to other very, very wealthy men. Uh, the first one he reached out to was Bud Adams. Uh, Bud Adams uh, was the heir uh, to another a petroleum family, the Adams family uh, connected with Phillips Petroleum, again, down in uh, Texas and Houston. Uh, and so that will grow into eight individuals uh, that will all own teams and they will begin play in 1960. Uh, many people called them very foolish. The idea that they could take on the NFL, that they had that kind of arrogance. Uh, they had a whole lot of money, but did they even know anything about football? One thing they knew, um, they recognized that they had to put out a little bit different product than what the NFL had, and they did that. Um, the AFL, without question, is very instrumental in the recruitment of African-American football players from historically black schools. Every AFL team, uh, when it is founded, has at least uh, uh, several individuals, African-Americans, uh, on their respective rosters. And the overwhelming majority of them have an African-American from a historically black school. Uh, and so they begin to use scouting in a way uh, that because they have to be meticulous. Uh, they, they have to, they cannot necessarily be arrogant and say that you can't have an opportunity on my team if you don't play from a very, at, at a very large uh, university. Uh, and so they reach out to the Jackson States and the Prairie Views and the Gramblings uh, and begin to recruit some of the best and brightest uh, talent uh, ever seen in, in, in pro football. Of course, they play a very, very different style of football uh, in terms of throwing the ball. Uh, teams have a little bit different coloring in terms of their uniforms. Uh, they use television in a brilliant way in terms of close-ups. Uh, and they also do something that is very revolutionary. And that is a revenue share in terms of their teams. Uh, just because you're located in a large city, you can't carve out your own television contract. We all share the revenue from television uh, based upon that we all have, we're, there are eight teams, and so eight teams share equally in all of the money from, from that we negotiate in terms of television. Uh, and so during the first few years of the, of the AFL, it is relatively successful. Um, it begins to slowly get uh, a, a strong following using television. Fans begin to buy into uh, respective teams in terms of their cities. And by the time this All-Star game is scheduled in New Orleans in 1965, um, the AFL was thinking about expansion and was looking at New Orleans uh, because there were no professional teams in New Orleans. And New Orleans was a city that felt like it was ready to get on the national scene in terms of having a professional franchise of some sort. And they wanted, they wanted football. And uh, so by scheduling this all-star game uh, that was going to be played at Tulane Stadium, uh, the idea was, well, let's, let's have a dry run. Let's see how it works out. Let's see how many fans you can turn out. Uh, and we'll see whether or not something can be worked out in terms of potentially granting a team, an expansion team in the city of New Orleans. One of the things, however, that happens is segregation is extremely rigid in New Orleans. And so these black players that begin to arrive in the city of New Orleans to play uh, for the East and West All AFL All-Star team, uh, they begin to become extremely disgruntled. From the time they arrive at the New Orleans airport, White cab drivers won't pick them up. Uh, some are able to be picked up, some aren't. Some have to ride with white players to get to their respective hotel. They get their respective hotel, hotels, and they begin to do what football players do. They begin to congregate in the lobby and say, hey, we're going to venture down to the French Quarter uh, to go out, have drinks, have food, relax, uh, and see what the city of New Orleans offers. 
Well, when they go into the French Quarter, they are treated in a way that really begins to get them highly upset. They're not allowed to come into a number of clubs. Uh, they're called the N-word. Um, people are openly uh, pointing to them and talking about how large they are and, and, and the fact that I've never seen someone uh, that looks this big and, and, and this dark and so on and so forth. Um, and the players really begin to get very, very upset. Um, there are uh, certain situations where, uh, you know, individuals that are bouncers uh, have guns uh, and are very adamant that we don't care how big you are, you're not getting ready to come into this establishment. And so after a few hours of this, these African-American players go back to their respective hotels and they begin to talk among themselves and they decide that they're going to have a meeting the following day. And they meet in a hotel in New Orleans. And there are several key individuals that begin to emerge as the leaders of this idea that they begin to circulate of not playing this game. Uh, the individual in the picture here, Abner Hayes, was a phenomenal running back for the Dallas Texans, uh, Mr. Lamar's team. Uh, Cookie Gilchrist is an outstanding running back as well for the Buffalo Bills. And the two of them call everyone together and they sit down. Now, practice is going on. Uh, the buses leave the hotels and go to the stadium so these respective East and West All-Star teams can practice. Several of the white players on the bus uh, look around and begin to realize hey, something's going on here, something's wrong. Uh, this bus should have more people on it. What's going on? Well, and then another white player says, hey, uh, the black players are meeting. Uh, none of the black players are on the bus. And what's going on? From what I hear, not sure. They may not. They may not be willing to play. They may be. Boy, they're thinking about maybe potentially boycotting. And so, uh, these black players sit in this hotel room, and really, Cookie Gilchrist, uh, who is six two, uh, a good two hundred and twenty five pounds, uh, and had been compared to the great Jim Brown in terms of his running style. Uh, he basically stands up and he looks around and he says, we're gonna take a vote. And from what uh, a number of people have articulated uh, in terms of what he says to kind of paraphrase it, I will whip anybody's ass that decides to play this game. And so there was a unanimous vote that we're not going to play this game. And even the white players return back from practice, they come and meet. Uh, Jack Kemp, for example, was one of the key players, uh, outstanding quarterback, who played with Cookie Gilchrist on the Buffalo Bills. Uh, Steve Mix, phenomenal offensive lineman uh, with the Los Angeles Chargers or San Diego Chargers by that time. Um, they all kind of try to meet with with. Hayes and Gilchrist and several other black players and say, hey, don't you think it would be better if you went on ahead and played and you had these, you did uh, some interviews and you articulated that uh, this is why you aren't playing this game. And for the most part, they almost said like, hell no, that's not what we're going to do. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're, we think it's going to send a stronger message uh, in terms of where we are as athletes uh, if we do not play this game. Uh, and so uh, they meet with their respective owners. Uh, this is Cookie Gilchrist, the size of his thighs. Uh, young kid uh, can barely grab him. He was a, 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 a really phenomenal uh, running back. And uh, Abner Hayes and, and Gilchrist uh, basically, uh, in essence, put together a kind of statement uh, that why they weren't playing this game 
And then they make another strategic decision. Uh, they send Ernie Ladd, the largest, one of the largest maybe players in the history of all of professional football. They elect him as the spokesman. Ernie Ladd had no choice. Uh, 6'9", 300, about 25 pounds, played with the uh, San Diego Chargers. Uh, they give him the statement, say, listen, this is what you're going to read, articulate why we're doing what, what it is that we're doing. And Ernie Ladd had no real recourse. He, he was basically voted for this uh, responsibility without having any veto power. And they send him out to these reporters. Uh, and in essence, this is a um, program uh, that advertised for this All-Star game, the fourth annual All-Star game that was supposed to take place, of course, in New Orleans. And it is moved to Houston, Texas. New Orleans loses the revenue and really many individuals that are in the leadership in the business um, section of the community of New Orleans are extremely worried about, did we just jeopardize our opportunity to get a professional franchise? And there's some irony here. Um, the game is played uh, and in essence, uh, it's a game where it's just a strong turnout in terms of fans. Uh, a number of people talk to these players and interview them. Uh, they articulate that they're very happy to be in Houston. Uh, by this time, Houston has kind of begun to move in a direction where it's not anywhere as rigidly segregated as New Orleans. And New Orleans could have potentially come into the AFL had it not been for the way in which these players were treated uh, in 1965. And of course, what's going to happen in 1967, um, an expansion team will be awarded uh, to New Orleans, the Saints, uh, two years later. And so interestingly enough, um, New Orleans potentially could have had a NFL franchise maybe a year or two earlier, uh, but, but again, uh, that did not happen because of the treatment of these players in 1965. And so this is a very, very, very important uh, event. Uh, there are a number of things that happen up until this point uh, in terms of African-Americans uh, in sports uh, kind of pushing the envelope. Bill Russell, for example, uh, decided that uh, he and some of his black teammates were not going to play in a game in Kentucky, an exhibition game in Kentucky. Um, uh, there were a number of other kind of isolated kind of situations. Jackie Robinson, uh, while he was uh, toiling in the Negro Leagues, uh, was very adamant uh, when they were barnstorming, when they were moving around the country, that uh, we stopped somewhere uh, in, this, uh, in this station wagon or bus or whatever we we're traveling in, uh, and uh, we can't uh, go in and eat. Uh, they want to just uh, not let us have any kind of drink of water, want us to go get a hose, pour it in a Coca-Cola bottle. Uh, we're not going to spend our money here. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, and so uh, there are a lot of kind of isolated incidents, but this uh, event that takes place in 1965 is very important uh, because it is a boycott in which you have players in a league uh, able to move a game by pushing back on the way in which they were treated. Uh, it's one thing to not participate like Russell or buy something, uh, whatever the case may be. But in many ways, these players really kind of begin to set the tone uh, for other individuals that's going to follow uh, in the late 1960s, uh, individuals, of course, Muhammad Ali, John Carlos, Tommy Smith in the 68 Olympics, so on and so forth, that will begin to say, yeah, um, we have a voice. And even though during this time period, 
black players were supposed to be very, very, very thankful uh, for the opportunity. You really were supposed to not have any kind of political opinion or any kind of opinion about what's going on in current events. Uh, you could be working a job in a steel mill, but here you are now playing football. And so uh, this event, uh, in essence, sets the tone for uh, athletes to begin to say no. Um, yes, uh, because we, in fact, have this opportunity does not confine us to a realm of silence as we see discrimination and other things taking place that are wrong. Now, in terms of how we have gotten to kind of where we are today, Emmett Till on the left, Trayvon Martin on the right, almost look the same, almost identical in age. Uh, both got things that are over their heads. Emmett Till with a hat there, Trayvon Martin with a hood, walking through the neighborhood in Sanford, Florida in 2012. Uh, in essence, basically like any other kid, going in the shore, buying Skittles, iced tea. Going back, he's in this neighborhood. And of course, uh, this local white citizen by the name of uh, George Zimmerman calls local police and he characterizes Trayvon Martin as basically a thug, a lawbreaker, a criminal. Uh, doesn't know Trayvon Martin, simply has on a hood uh, and in essence articulates that he's gotta be up to something. He's a young black man walking at night with his hood on, he's getting ready to break into somebody's house. He's getting ready to break into somebody's car. Uh, very clearly, um, if you've heard any of the audio between him and the 911, 911 operator, he's, he's he done anything? No, not yet. But these guys always get away with this. Uh, specifically tells him, don't approach this young man. We're dispatching the police. You're not a police officer. And of course, uh, George Zimmerman shoots and kills Trayvon Martin because he just can't do it. He can't not uh, basically keep all of this kind of racism that he has inside without, in essence, putting it into action. And so he approaches uh, this young man, shoots him. They have uh, some kind of confrontation. And he shoots and kills him. And as you can see, not a real big difference between these two people in this picture, 14 year old uh, Emmett Till and 17 year old Trayvon Martin, two individuals who uh, never really had an opportunity to contribute to society, raise families, uh, basically because they were black and uh, racism basically uh, just took their life away. Barack Obama, elected in 2008, and an election, of course, is historic. First uh, African-American uh, president of the United States. A uh, number of people voted for him, particularly white people. Many people felt like, hey, we're moved we're moving and we have now arrived in this kind of post-racial moment in America. That in fact, uh, this indicates that there's, this has been, a, this is a significant achievement when you start talking about race relations and all of the things surrounding that in terms of the United States of America. And Barack Obama did an immaculate job of trying to really kind of neutralize his race throughout his campaign and even as president. Uh, but there were moments where uh, he couldn't do that. Uh, and after uh, basically the murder of Trayvon Martin, uh, Barack Obama said, if I had a son, he would look like Trayvon. And many people 
uh, that was kind of like, uh, is are you are you just giving us your personal opinion? Are you? Are, I mean, what are you saying? And, and in essence, um, to be maybe even more frank, articulating that I could have been Trayvon. Uh, that this could have happened to me. And I've been very lucky. Um, I find myself in some very, very, very different situations. I have education. I've been able to go to Harvard and served on uh, Harvard's Law Review. But if I didn't have all those things behind me, I could have easily found myself in this same kind of situation as this young man, somebody identified simply because of your race. Uh, and Trayvon Martin is followed uh, by Michael Brown. Uh, I have a I have this picture here uh, specifically because it's a picture from him graduating from high school. Uh, and of course, uh, he is killed by police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, and walking down the street, his body lays in the street for several hours after he's been killed. People are very, very, very upset. Uh, doesn't have a weapon. Uh, Police officer articulates that he was scared that he tried to reach in. He did all these other things. He crossed the line. He was he was selling marijuana. Uh, he bullied the store clerk. Uh, he is a hoodlum. Uh, and even if he didn't do exactly what I thought I I'm, I'm accusing him of, he probably did something else. And so um, in essence, um, you know, even though I crossed the line in terms of using uh, deadly force, uh, like Emmett Till and like Trayvon, uh, there's this narrative that do black lives have the same value? Um, do they have the same kind of worth as white lives? Uh, Lando Castile uh, was another case uh, and even more pointed because a camera phone captured what exactly transpired uh, as he sat in this car and was stopped by a police officer basically in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And his girlfriend, Diamond, in essence, Reynolds has his cell phone on and Philando says, yes, I do have a weapon. And they at just, I gotta take the weapon out. I'm, gonna, I, I'm not, you know, I'm letting you know up front I have a weapon. Uh, and, you know, I am trying to allow you now to confiscate that weapon. Uh, and um, he, in fact, articulated that wasn't even going for the weapon that he, in fact, was going for his driver's license. But he's notified the police officers that he did, in fact, have a weapon. And he shot and killed right there on camera in front of individuals that are just watching this as this footage goes all across America. And so this is the backdrop and why and what fueled Colin Kaepernick on August the 26th of 2016. Uh, he seen Trayvon and Michael Brown and Philando Castile and, his, and he decided that, yeah, I'm the quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers and I make millions of dollars. And I have an opportunity to maybe make even more money in terms of endorsements. And I've been to the Super Bowl uh, and I've led my team and I'm the most important player on my team. And I'm in a place that very few African-Americans are in. That is having a certain amount of leverage as a starting quarterback of a of one of 32 NFL teams as an African American. Uh, but beyond all of that, um, I'm a black man and I relate directly to what I'm seeing. And so he decides that he's not going to stand up. That in fact, he uh, in essence um, is going to take a knee because he wants to bring attention to a discrimination and, and all of this kind of police brutality that he's seen. 
Of course, the San Francisco 49ers released him in 2016. The picture I showed you uh, at the beginning of, of this talk, his teammates really began to buy into this, but it becomes very, very, very polarizing. And in fact, it is really polarized by the president of the United States who decides he can't take it anymore. And he's got to insert his opinion. And he comes right to the crux. And in many ways, his statement basically has a couple of meanings. Number one, these black players that you're paying, they need to get in line. They could be somewhere either selling drugs or trying to hustle and make it. Uh, you know, they're probably not that smart. Uh, yeah, they've been able to get to college. The only reason they get to college is because they can play college football. And so they should be thankful for this opportunity to make this kind of money that they're making. The second part of this statement was to these white owners. Aren't you paying these guys? Aren't you billionaires? You need to act like it. You're white men. Act like you have an understanding that you control them. They must capitulate to you. You don't capitulate to them. You don't allow them to make decisions about what happens. And so this frames this whole narrative. Kaepernick is ostracized, pushed out, and the NFL, in essence, sides with Donald Trump. Which brings us to today. And this was a narrative until Minneapolis 2020, when the same thing plays itself out. You have Rodney King in 91. You have all of these things that have taken place that I've talked about. And George Floyd is murdered on the streets of Minneapolis by one white police officer in particular who puts his knee on his neck and other officers who stand by and don't intervene. And it is captured again on video. Cities explode across the country. Uh, and to kind of close uh, so that I can open it up for questions. We're now in a moment. The question is kind of where are we? Because after George Floyd this summer, everybody bought in. NBA players now had jerseys with people's name, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon. Uh, stuff was on people's shoes. People had on their helmets on the back, let's all come together, Black Lives Matter. Even the baseball players, Major League had things on their uniforms. People playing tennis had all kinds of statements and connections to all of these tragedies that have taken place. We have a new president and he ran on this platform of being committed to dealing with these various issues. Hopefully, we're going to begin to get some fundamental change in this country as it relates to this. I am a person that, you know, stuff on the back of a uniform, shoes, commercials, um, that's one thing. We need federal legislation. We need laws that begin to address Many of the things that have happened in this country, on the streets of America, towns of America, cities of America, in which we clearly see African-Americans uh, not being able to afford all of the fundamental rights put forth in the United States Constitution. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to questions. All right, thank you very much, Chuck, for that stirring uh, talk and informative talk. 
Um, as you take a look over at the chat box, please throw in there your questions for, for Chuck that you'd like for him to address. All right. Um, as you all are doing that, as those uh, questions come in over in the chat box, I, I have a question uh, that I, I'd like to ask. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. It's a, it's a historian's question, to be sure, but it's also, I think, a comparative one that I hope will we'll draw some comparisons between 1965 and more recently. Um, in response to the all-star boycott, what was the res response of AFL fans? Um, how did they respond to it overall? You mentioned that um, the AFL was particularly actively recruiting from HBCUs. Um, did it have a fan base that was 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 similarly you know diverse in terms of, of fans for the AFL as they're developing their fan base and how did they respond to boycott and how was that perhaps similar or different to uh, NFL fan bases today responding to of course um, Kaepernick's uh, protests and more recent uh, wranglings over Black Lives Matters and so forth. I would say the AFL fan base um, was different than the NFL fan base because the AFL fan base um, was one in which uh, many young people, part of this whole kind of counterculture, um, you know, someone that I really was infatuated with uh, doing my book on the AFL was Joe Namath. Uh, Joe Namath really personified this kind of generation. Uh, in a lot of ways, you know, he wore his hair long, sideburns, white shoes. Um, but he also was very, very sensitive to race. A lot of people don't know this, that, um, you know, he spent a lot of time, uh, you know, connecting with African-American players uh, in a way in which uh, he really wanted to kind of get to know uh, a lot of the things that they were going, uh, going through. So um, I think that uh, there clearly were fans that um, were very, very, very supportive uh, and and fully understood if you're going and you're supporting New York Jets or you're supporting uh, Kansas City Chiefs or some other AFL team, um, you're, 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 you're not, you, 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 you're kind of uh, not really embracing the conservatism uh, of the New York Giants or the Chicago Bears. Uh, and so it's not only just the style of play on the field, but it's also that these players, um, the way in which they dress, the way in which they carry themselves, they're connecting with that fan base that's coming uh, uh, to the games. And so, um, you know, I would say that uh, it doesn't hurt uh, in terms of this boycott. It does not hurt that they move the game in um, – Gilchrist and, and Haynes are in fact traded to different teams uh, after this boycott. Uh, they feel like maybe the owners themselves uh, are a little bit punitive on them as the leaders. Um, Gilchrist uh, is uh, an older player with a lot of, a lot of miles on him at that point. Um, and Abner Haynes is kind of in the twilight of his career. And so whether or not it was simply a business decision or they were, being punished for being involved. Um, they felt like they were being punished. And so you have to kind of um, give them credit for, for understanding the culture of the league. Uh, but I do think that um, uh, the fans uh, really identify because there's a whole different kind of style of, um, of football, a whole different kind of style of thinking that's emerging in America during this time period uh, that isn't as uh, conservative and the AFL really is representative of this whole kind of kind of culture, um, uh, kind of identity that is sweeping across uh, many areas in, in America. Good question. Yeah, thank you so much, Chuck. Yeah, very interesting. Um, we have a few folks that are chiming in with their questions and comments. Um, first from Gage. Um, why do you think New Orleans was so quick to get an expansion team after the protests and canceling of the All-Star game only, only two years after the boycott? Well, they worked out a, a real interesting uh, – there, there was an interesting deal. Okay, so 
the reason New Orleans gets this uh, franchise is that the NFL um, was uh, coming up against uh, um, legislation in terms of uh, trying to expand. And so uh, they had to have kind of like congressional approval. Uh, and in essence, the individual who had that kind of power in the U.S. Congress was a congressman out of Louisiana. And the NFL, in the NFL, by 19, by, after 19, in 1966, the NFL and the AFL decided that they were going, uh, in essence, to merge. And so for that merger to take place, uh, basically, they had to sign off in, in, in as old and say that they were not necessarily a monopoly in terms of pro, pro football. And so for that merger to, in essence, be approved by the federal government, they needed this congressman to, in essence, make sure that the agreement would go through, that there wouldn't be any kind of pushback by the federal government. And the way it was described uh, and the way it actually supposedly uh, took place is that uh, I think it was Congressman Landrew that uh, when uh, Pete Rosell came to him and said, look, we need your help. Uh, we got to make sure that this agreement goes through uh, television, everything, territorial rights. Uh, he said, fine, you know, I'll make sure it happens. No problem. But New Orleans gets a team. And he says, well, uh, we're going to try to do the best we can. Uh, Roselle didn't really want to come out and ab absolutely commit. And Landrew supposedly stopped on the stairs and looked at him in the eyes and said, listen, if New Orleans doesn't get a team, this will be the biggest mistake of your effing life. I will make your life absolutely miserable. And he walked on down the steps. And so as a part of this merger, for the AFL and the NFL to come together and now have what you have today, which is the NFL uh, in terms of the AFC and the NFC, um, New Orleans got a team because Landrew at the time, who was the congressman out of uh, New Orleans, uh, made sure uh, that there would be no monopolistic kind of charges that would come forth and trip up this merger. Uh, and that's why New Orleans was able to have a team come 1967. That's great. Now, I have two other comments here, but I'll invite anybody else that's listening. If you want, if you want to ask a question, now is definitely the time to do it. So feel free to put it over in the uh, chat thread. But these two other comments, I think we can splice together because they seem to hit on a similar theme. Um, one is from Don. Can you tell us more about how the white players like Kemp and others reacted to the boycott? Were, were they supportive? And then the follow on to that and maybe speak more comparatively, um, you know, what sort of co what comments might you have about the quick about face of NFL leadership, ownership, white teammates to the BLM movement, particularly resulting from the murder of George Floyd? Um, in essence, you know, white reactions to, to these protests, both then as well as now, where do you see the kind of historical comparisons and, and differences? Well, there's been some there's a great six part series on the AFL that uh, was done aired first on Showtime. And they had a lot of interviews with uh, players that were involved in this boycott. And they interviewed, uh, you know, Jack Kemp who went on and became a congressman and, and um, Ron Mix and several other white players. And, you know, they got ready to get on the bus and then they went up to the hotel room and, uh, you know, from what I understand, Cookie Gilchrist was just so non, no nonsense, so dug in, uh, so inflexible. Uh, they couldn't convince him uh, to change and decide to go on ahead and play the game in New Orleans. He, you know, he really referenced uh, the '64 Civil Rights Act. He referenced, you know, all of the stuff that Black people have had to go through in America, and here they are now um, in 1965, as he was saying. Uh, we, we're not just going to take this stuff. And so uh, after this talk and after all of this dialogue, Kemp and several other players, Mix and others, say, okay, we see where you're coming from. We're going to back you up. Let's try to get this game moved. Um, 
And uh, interesting in terms of the second part of that question, uh, the NFL, um, you know, there's so much backlash uh, with the death of George Floyd um, that the owners, uh, and they're a very interesting group. I had an interview with a reporter from the New York Times uh, a couple of days ago, and we were talking about um, the shortage of black coaches being hired in the NFL. And I made the, I made the statement that, you know, these NFL owners, they are very astute and conscious about not doing interviews uh, where these questions can be asked of them. And so they send out Roger Goodell, who has to do this now fundamental, all of a sudden we're going we now recognize we got to be more sensitive. Colin Kaepernick is right. We want to give him a trial. Uh, they don't. They don't even come out themselves and say they don't even. No, none of them have a press conference. They've got several committees where NFL owners sit on them, where this kind of things fall under the, old, the, the, the jurisdiction of that committee. They don't come out and say anything. They pay this commissioner about forty million dollars a year. He's got to go out there and he's got to be the face of the league come out there and in essence try to explain to America why they are doing uh, and going full circle. And, um, uh, you know, you'd like to see that kind of change. Uh, and it probably is not going to happen because they pay him a lot of money uh, to do a lot of these things. But um, the, it's th the 32 NFL owners are the ones that make these kind of decisions. And because of what was going on, uh, I think, uh, particularly with Black uh, uh, black people in this country um, and all of the tentacles of that. And not only that, when you think about George Floyd now, there were a number of white people that were very, very connected and involved. I mean, they shut down Portland, Oregon. And so when you start talking about not only black people, but many white people who are very passionate about this, who are consumers, who support your product, you got to take this very, very, very seriously. And so for you not to address it or go back and say, look, the president was wrong. Um, and even though you got a lot of owners that are very connected with, with Donald, Donald Trump, uh, they recognize that at the bottom line, the bottom line is money. And so they, they decided to capitulate. Great question. Yeah, and I think to end things up, I have just one brief question, or maybe one you can respond to briefly just to make the quick connection. Uh, Mary asked, I'm wondering about the AFL culture. Uh, did it have any influence on the increasing activism of players, particularly in the players' union of the 1970s? That's a great question, and yes, uh, it did. Um, uh, because once they merge, um, uh, the – the NFL's Players Association begins to get stronger. Um, they have a couple of strikes early in the 1970s. Um, but stronger is a relative term because the NFL Players Association uh, is arguably the weakest of the three major unions uh, in terms of uh, major sports in America. Um, major League Baseball players are extremely strong. They have arguably the strongest union followed by NBA players. And NFL players are really in a lot of precarious situations because they don't have guaranteed contracts. And so, um, you know, it's really frustrating when you see some of the um, agreements that they make with uh, NFL owners in terms of uh, the way the labor landscape is gonna really play itself out. They, they always find themselves kind of in the short end of the stick don't have guaranteed contracts. Uh, NFL owners have with first round uh, draft choices, the opportunity to have a fifth year that they can control them. And then of course, there's no real free agency. Um, Major League Baseball players have free agency as do the NBA. Uh, NFL players really don't have that. So yeah, this activism seeps in and it helps to get NFL players. But a lot of that though, in terms of unions, the history of unions and the three major sports, uh, there's a great book uh, called uh, titled Lords of the Realm, uh, written by uh, uh, Hell Yar, H E L Y E R. You want to know anything about Baseball Players Union and how it really affects, uh, because it is the model. 
uh, of, of, of terms of unions of sports uh, in this country. Uh, baseball players have done an immaculate job uh, really since Marvin Miller got involved in the 1960s up until today. Good question. All righty. I think we've come to our uh, end of session. Um, on behalf of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture, I'd like to extend a thanks to Chuck for his wonderful talk today. Uh, please join me in giving him some uh, online Zoom applause if you love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next South Talk uh, is detailed in the chat. Hope to see y'all then and there. All righty. Hey, thanks, thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks a lot, After Appreciate the opportunity.